Our opening words this morning are by Unitarian poet Athena Banner. Sharing losses. Loss binds us together undeniably. Like the aching low moan of a viola. You feel it first. Other senses follow. You feel it in that place where the keening cry of a wounded heart begins. In loss, we could be family, in that shared knowing and need. In these chances to rebirth kindness to each other. Such a beautiful phrase, isn't it, <clears throat> in these chances to rebirth kindness to each other. And one way to be rebirth kindness, as we've known for many years in this congregation, is to have our hearts in a holy place. Please rise in body or spirit to sing one of our favorite gathering songs. Unitarian Church. 
This is a place we tend with care because the people who gather here are dear to us and the purposes we seek here are uplifting for us. In this place and during this hour, we live out a story of hope. Hope that our hearts are in a holy place. Hope that in our shared losses, we can rebirth kindness to each other. Hope that all can feel welcome here, no matter who you are or what you do, no matter who you love or what you question. And hope that together we can learn the ways of peace and justice ever more deeply and share those the best we can with everyone we meet. And of course, that includes our local Coast Salish neighbors on whose traditional territories and unceded lands we gather. Our service today is specifically about finding hope in the face of loss and grief, about finding hope despite the inevitable challenges, losses, and conflicts that come into all of our lives. My name is Susan Forbes, and I'm your service coordinator today. Catherine Nicholson, who many of you know, will be our primary speaker. I'll introduce Catherine later in the service, but first, she will light our chalice as we join together using familiar words. We kindle this flame as a symbol of our gathering. In this community of care, we hold and witness one another through the seasons of our lives. May our sanctuary hold whatever is on your heart today. There is room among us for joy and sorrow, celebration and mourning, and everything in between. Today we're particularly thinking of uh, Jim Stevenson. He returned home on Wednesday evening after being in hospital for just over a week. His surgery was a success and his recovery is going well and his family, of course, are ecstatic. Both Jim and Marsha appreciate all the calls and best wishes that they've received. Uh, no visitors for a while yet as Jim regains his strength. And the same goes for June Hahn. She's not up to visitors yet, but you may have heard last week uh, that she's broken her hip, sadly. So for that which has been shared and for all the that remains in the silent sanctuaries of our hearts. Catherine's going to light a candle of hope and caring for our community. And Catherine's also going to light a candle of global concern, a candle of witness, as we recall the people and places near and far whose stories weigh on our minds and hearts. And there are many of them these days throughout the world. May we extend to all beings the compassion we offer one another here. Peace be upon each and all. I want to introduce the service to you. The idea came from a conversation I had last spring with Suzanne Krebs. Uh, many of you know her as a long-term member of this church and along with her husband Hans. And you may also know Suzanne as a very kind person with a calm demeanor and a good head on her shoulders. Suzanne and I were chatting back in Janie's office in the spring after one of our many church meetings last year, I think it was the AGM, and we were talking about the unfortunate division in our congregation and wondering what might be the right approach to dealing with the confusion and the sense of loss that we were both feeling about what had happened. And I know that even yet we don't have all the answers to that dilemma, but at the time, Suzanne said, well, we can't just shove this whole thing under the rug and pretend it never happened, or something to that effect. <laughs> and, and we thought, well, somehow we're going to have to grieve the losses that there have been here, and we'll have to go through some kind of uh, process to come together. So Suzanne's comments stayed with me, and I thought about what might be the best approach to doing that. How do we do that in a way that doesn't just rub salt into the wounds and, and reinvigorate contentious arguments? Well, one way I thought would be to center a service around the very topic of grief and loss. 
and not just our NSUC grief, but, but grief in general. And that's why I immediately thought of asking Catherine Nicholson to speak to us today. Some of you know Catherine's background, but I'll remind us all of some of her qualifications and experience. Catherine has played many roles in her life, including registered nurse, wife and mom, musician, music therapist, music director for 14 years of this very church, choral director of several community choirs, and most important in our context here today, as a registered clinical counselor in palliative and hospice care at the BC Cancer Agency for 12 years, Canuck Place Children's Hospice for 10 years, and Vancouver Hospice for eight years. And she currently serves on the board of directors for the Vancouver Hospice. Catherine has a way with words and with music. And I'm so grateful that she agreed to share her talents with us today. She'll begin with a story for all ages called Lifetimes. Good morning. If there were children here, I'd sit down there, unless there's many wannabe children who'd like to come sit on the steps here. I'll just read the story from up here. I, I did pick this story. I used to use it with the children uh, that I worked with at the hospice, and uh, this one seemed to be particularly appropriate even for um, the gathered adults here. There is a beginning and an ending for everything that is alive and in between is the living. All around us everywhere, beginnings and endings are going on all the time with the living in between. That's true for all living things. For plants, for people, for birds, for fish, for trees, even for the tiniest insect. Nothing that is alive goes on living forever. How long it lives depends on what it is and what happens while it's living. Sometimes living things become ill or they get hurt. Mostly, of course, they get better again, but there are times when they are so badly hurt or they are so ill that they die simply because they can no longer stay alive. There are so many living things in our world and each one has its own special lifetime. Trees that are tall and strong grow slowly Standing in the sunshine and in the rain, some of them live for a very long time indeed, as long as a hundred years or more. Rabbits and mice grow up in only a few weeks. They go on to live for a year or two, crunching up carrots, nibbling at cheese until they grow old and very tired, and it is their time to die. Flowers and vegetables planted as seeds at the beginning of spring when the earth is warm, grow quickly to live through the heat of summer. The days pass, they become old during autumn when it's cooler, and then when winter comes, it's cold and they die. That's the way they live, and that is their lifetime. Butterflies, they live only for a few weeks. Once they've dried their wings, they flutter and flit from leaf to flower, and at first they are bright and quick, maybe like we are when we're children, and then as time passes, they begin to slow down until finally they can go no further. They rest for a while, and then they die. And birds grow up quite quickly, too. It's often no more than a few months from the time they hatch until they're strong enough to fly and feed themselves. How long they live seems to depend upon their size. Mostly, the bigger they are, the longer they live. And fish, swimming in lakes and rivers or in the sea, can be so tiny it's hard to tell that they're there at all. Or so big that the only way to describe them is enormous. 
Their lives can be as little as a day or two, or as long as 80 or 90 years. And people, well, like everything else that is alive, people have lifetimes too. They can live for 60 or 70 years, sometimes even longer. Good morning, Sonia. (laughs) Doing all the things that people do, like growing up and being grown up and getting old. It can happen, though, just as it does with all other living things, that people, even children, become ill or they get hurt. Mostly, of course, they get better again, but there are times when they are so badly hurt or so ill that they die because they can no longer stay alive. That's sad. But that's how it is for people. So no matter how long they are or how short, lifetimes are all the same in one important way. They have beginnings and endings, and there is the living in between. And as I was reading this book again, I thought, I think that applies to communities too sometimes. Beginnings and endings. And then things shift and change. Change is the one thing we can count on. And the choir's gonna sing a, a beautiful song that talks about keeping our sights on horizons and the wind in our sails. And I think we're going to talk a little more about that as we go on in this service.
Grief is the price we pay for love. These words that I chose for the title of my talk today are adapted from a passage by Dr. Colin Murray Parks, a palliative care psychiatrist in his book, Bereavement, Studies of Grief in Adult Life. A passage which I now fully quote. He said, the pain of grief is just as much a part of life as the joy of love. It is perhaps the price we pay for love, the cost of commitment. So my title, the adapted version of this quote, came from a story involving my dad. And I actually told this to, uh, to Sue one day, and she said, that's, that's the kernel of where we're going to start from. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to tell the story. When my dad was in his early 90s, he was living in a condo in Burlington, Ontario, with my mum. When he moved around the hallways or in and out of the elevator with his walker, he would often encounter his grumpy elderly neighbor, John. John had lost his wife some years before. He had no children and had chosen to disengage mostly, disengage socially. Most of the other people in the building had labeled him a difficult curmudgeon to be avoided whenever possible. However, my father, who had become quite, I'm going to say, soft-hearted <laughs> in a very dear way in his declining years, decided to make it his mission to try and love up this lonely old guy. He told this to my sister. Whenever Dad saw him, he would chat him up and he'd talk about the weather or the stock market or, or the latest Tiger Cats football game or whatever. And although John often responded only with a grunt, Dad persevered for over a year until finally one day, John began to smile and converse a little. This engagement of theirs continued for many months until, unfortunately, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. He became bedridden and then passed away quite suddenly. I was staying with Mum when a few days after the notice of Dad's death appeared in the local paper, and there was a soft knock at the door of the condo. It was John. He had departed, but he had left some flowers and a beautiful card. And along with the standard message of condolence, he had handwritten in the card, your husband, Gordon McFarlane, was one of the finest men I had ever known. Grief is the price we pay for love. Grief is complex. What exactly are we grieving when a parent dies, for instance? In my experience, it's not only the loss of someone so dear to us, but it's also the loss of our sense of safe harbor in the world. When a child dies, I have seen parents grieving not only for a future denied to that precious piece of themselves, but also ultimately for their inability as a parent to protect their child from harm. If a partner dies, the one who is left grieves, of course, for their loved one's suffering, for a life cut short, but also they are grieving for their own loneliness and the fear of trying to cope with life alone. The grief one might feel if faced with a terminal diagnosis seems to be different for different people. For some, it could be the fear of pain and suffering, for others, it might be the grief of leaving loved ones behind or for business left unfinished. Grief is complex. I remember when I was working at, at uh, Canuck Place Children's Hospice, I came into the room of a child who was dying, a teenager, and uh, sitting talking to her. She wasn't very communicative, but I would play the guitar and I would sit by her bed. She liked that. and. Um, she told me one day that she wasn't worried about dying. She was worried that her parents were going to miss her so much. So she was worried more about her parents than she was about herself. I also think grief is cumulative. In my experience, both personally and in my many years of work in palliative and hospice care, grief is almost always not just about a single loss. 
not just about the loss of a person, a pet, a job, or even a treasured object. It is also about what was, what is, what could have been. The loss of hope, love, expectations, dreams. I have come to understand that I myself hold some real grief from my childhood. I was one of five children, privileged to grow up in a generally happy, stable, safe environment with loving parents. However, as I remember it, we as children were expected to pretty much fend for ourselves emotionally and physically to some extent. After all, my father was a doctor, so, you know, I, <laughs> I never had a, a actually physical until after I got married. <laughs> it was always dad looking at me saying, you look, you look fine, and he'd sign the sheet, and off I'd go to work. <laughs> we were encouraged not to wallow in self-pity, not to linger on the slings and arrows that are an inevitable part of life. Put on your big girl panties, my mother used to say. You'll be fine. Off you go. Don't whine. Run around the block. You'll be ten times better. <laughs> and I remember very, take it on the chin. Take it on the chin. And uh, she even had a song about it. I remember it. Well, it goes like this. That's what mother said. That's what father said. That's what sister said. That's what brother said. Take it on the chin. Put on a happy grin and smile. <laughs> I think it might be the British way of saying suck it up, buttercup. I just <laughs> but seriously, I, I, I do, I grieve that lack of emotional safety net when I was young and vulnerable. I, I do think it's important to be resilient in one's life in this world. Um, and in fact, I think it's one of the most important things that you can teach your children, you know how to hang in there, how to be resilient. But I think also, don't we all yearn and need to be understood and comforted when we're hurt? I learned to protect my heart, to be strong and sturdy in the world. I learned not to reveal my fears, to brush off physical hurts, and to dismiss my disappointments. However, I was fortunate enough to have had exposure to music from an early age. Years of instruction in voice, piano, and French horn. And so music became a container and a vehicle with which to express not only the hurts, but also all the joy and passion that I felt inside me. I sang in choirs, played in orchestras, sang to my babies, taught music to my children. As a choral conductor, I have had the sheer pleasure of encouraging and teaching others how to make beautiful harmony and create wonderful community through music. When I returned to school at the age of 40, I was introduced to the power of music as therapy. I remember when I was working at the BC Cancer Agency and I went up to the bone marrow transplant unit one day because the nurse had asked me to come up um, I was good friends with all the nurses there, and they would call me on the phone and say, Catherine, come up. I'm not sure how to deal with the fellow in room whatever, room five, and he's, he's not actually talking to anybody, he's, and he, is, he does have a sarcoma. He is going to lose his leg. I think he's really depressed. I wonder if you could go in and talk to him. So I was always a little uh, nervous about walking into someone's room, but I did. I went in, and he said, so who are you? And I said... Well, my name is Catherine. I'm, I'm, I'm a counselor and I'm, I'm music because I had a guitar with me. And he went, he rolled his eyes. He was a professional world music drummer. And he looked at me and rolled his eyes and said, I don't think so, you know, so like. <laughs> and um, so I went, turned, went to go out of the room and he said, unless you have any Miriam McCabe. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do, because I had um, CDs in my room, and I happen to have a CD of this woman who's a, so, from South Africa, a brilliant singer. And um, so I came in, and at that time we had Walkmans with, uh, with CD, Discmans, I guess they were called, with earphones. And so I, I came in, he had his eyes closed, and I said, may I put the earphones on you? He said, yes. He didn't want to talk to me, but put the earphones on, and he 
and I turned it on and he said, oh my God, that's what I needed. And so I turned and left. The next day I came to work and I went up onto the unit and his door was open, his wife was there, she brought in his drum, she had her guitar. The nurses and other patients were gathered around the room and they were jamming in the room. He was sitting up and, um, and he said, go get your guitar. And uh, you know, I said to the nurse, what happened? She said, this is where he was this morning when he woke up. And I thought, you know, you never know, do you? But the music as therapy, I came to understand, has tremendous potential and power to heal. I have often reflected on what drew me to work in palliative and hospice care, where loss and grief are so intense and so constant. I look back on those many years of that tender work as a truly sacred practice for me. It was a privilege and an opportunity for profound personal growth. Because I came to realize that it has mostly been easier for me in my life to acknowledge and honor the grief of others rather than my own. As I've already said, grief accumulates. We tend to minimize and or store up our losses whether they be small or big ones, the loss of a job, a divorce, the death of a partner, the deterioration of one's own health. And so often we do not take the time or even understand how to fully grieve and or adjust to each loss in our lives. And so the accumulation builds and can come pouring out unexpectedly, intensely, angrily, sometimes in ways that are confusing and hurtful both to ourselves and to others. For North Shore Unitarians, I think it's important to gently acknowledge that individually and together, we are grieving. The losses that have occurred as a result of the recent split in this church community are profound. the loss of trust. Trust not only in one another, but also in the authenticity of our espoused UU values. That's a big one for me. These losses have caused immense sorrow and disillusionment amongst many of our members disrupted long-standing friendships. And this has not just elicited a collective outpouring of grief, but I believe has also triggered the deep existential angst that lies in all of us. The fear of being alone. Alone on our life's journey. It's a scary thought just when we thought we had a whole beloved community of fellow travelers alongside us. However, as our president, Barry Forbes, said in the first service a few weeks ago, this community is not broken. We are choosing to regroup, repair, and forge ahead into the future. We are committed to continue living intentionally with depth, meaning, and purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Yes. We are a beloved community of fellow travelers. And we are also individuals who need to think and decide for ourselves how we will live the values and principles that 
we as Unitarians espouse. So I'm going to ask you now to think about some of those values, and, and I maybe not think about them so much as just feel them. Feel them in your body. As I read out a small list of single words, they're not principles, not missions or sources, just words that are important to our endeavors in this community. So I invite you now to close your eyes if you wish. Make yourself a little more comfortable, perhaps, a little more grounded, relaxed. And pay attention to what you feel in your heart space, maybe, as I read, or as I say, each word. What words resonate in your body as you think about our community going forward. Kindness. Wisdom. Reason. Inspiration. I invite you now to open your eyes and return to this space that we, we call our sanctuary. And of course, there are many more words that I could have mentioned in the context of what we strive to affirm and promote in this community. And you'll have your own words that are even more dear to you. And one of those words just might be listening.
Are you listening? Are you listening? Do you know you're not alone? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm the voice that calls you home. Can you take a broken promise, find the truth that still remains? Can you hold a candle to the sun and kindle a new flame? Can you open up a window with the opening of your eyes? Can you let the river run away? Can you let your soul cry? Are you listening? Are you listening? Do you know you're not alone? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm the voice that calls you home. Can you speak the tender treasures that lie nestled in your heart? Can you take a precious moment and send it to the stars? Are you following the rhythm of the rocking of the waves? Are you standing in your darkness, being brave? Are you listening? Are you listening? Do you know you're not alone? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm the voice that calls you home. Time has left you hiding far away, far away. Angels have come calling you to pray. Come and pray. Come and play. Come and play. Are you listening? Are you listening? Do you know? please come forward as I invite us all into the spiritual practice of generosity. Our Sunday offerings go in full unless otherwise, is otherwise indicated to support organizations that our congregation particularly values. Today our, our uh, contributions will be shared between the Edible Garden Project and North Shore Neighborhood House. Thank you. 
in gratitude for your heartfelt generosity and what it does to help others beyond this community, we give thanks. And I also want to thank the many volunteers who have helped to put on this service today, especially Catherine Nicholson. Thank you, Catherine, for your wise words and beautiful music. Uh, and, I, and I just want to remind you about next Sunday as well. It's going to be in honor of our newly minted National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. I'll be your coordinator again. I hope you're not tired of me yet. Uh, but I'm imagining that if you're like me, you'll be very moved by what we have planned here. And, it, and it, it's going to end in a message of hope for the future. And we're also going to try something a bit different. And so it would be lovely in your, if you're in the room to see how you feel about uh, this little change. So please come, to, uh, come in person if you can. Uh, we'd love to see you all here. Um, now. Oh, one, yeah. Oh, Liz. <laughs> I didn't have it circled. <laughs> yeah, Liz is going to speak to you. She's from our board, and she's got a reminder and a couple of announcements. Thanks, Sue. I have two announcements for you. First off, uh, Rebecca, our vice president of our board, asked that I announce to you today that we are inviting contributions, donations to a Thanksgiving hamper that will be out probably in the lobby, Rebecca, um, next Sunday and October the 8th, the 1st and the 8th, which is Thanksgiving Sunday, for you to contribute. And um, all sorts of non-perishable goods are so very welcome, as we know. Um, canned fruit, tuna, cereal, cookies, coffee, plus personal items like toothbrushes, soap, shampoo, anything like that are so very much needed and very welcome, appreciated. The second announcement is that our Diane Hicks has prepared sandwiches for us downstairs for lunch today. Um, offering of $5 is, will be appreciated for the cost and coffee will be there. And then at 12.15 we have our town hall meeting up here where our board will present their plans and thoughts and ideas for the future going forward at this particular time that we've all been, been dealing with and wanting to I have ideas of where we're going to go forward. So the board will share with you and there will be lots of time for questions, your comments, your feedback to us as well. So we look forward to seeing you then. Okay, thank you. Rise as you are able to join our voices together to sing one more step. for our closing words, <clears throat> and I hope they remind us all of why 
for so many of us, this community is vital to living an examined and joyful life. Time together. Let us use our time together today and always to be kind, to be open to diversity, to be open to expression, to be open to compassion, to be open to sharing, and to be open to listening, to be open to exchange, to possibility, to awakening, and to be hopeful. We extinguish this flame, but carry with us the light of vision and the warmth of hope. The world calls to us to live with depth, meaning, and purpose. We go forth with courage and love.